Let's look at page number two. So we're probably going to look at, I'd say, 60 to 70 cases over the course of today. And the reason these cases are kind of important for the exam is because of something on page number two called stair diseases. So if you look at page number two, there's this concept of something called stair diseases. Basically, this is a legal theory that says that the way our courts work is that we rely on previous decisions. So, for example, if we know that your neighbor has a tree and that tree has roots that go underground onto your property, that's called an encroachment. You're not able, you are not able to kill the tree or sever the tree at the roots because that would be too harsh of an outcome. Killing the tree is too harsh of an outcome. Says who? That's a, that's a lawsuit called Busca versus Patel, and this is this concept of stare diseases. So, for example, we'll look in this chapter about a real estate agent who had sex with his wife's 16-year-old sister. Ridiculous. Should that, warrant li should that warrant license revocation? So we'll look at that case. It's called Donaldson versus Department of Real Estate. The outcome of that case might help us look at how future decisions are going to be laid out. So when we rely on previous decisions, that's a concept on page two of stare diseases. That's why a lot of these cases are super important because if you look at how something happened or something was decided before, this will help us look at what some future similar case might, uh, might be decided or how it might be decided. At the very bottom of page two, you'll see the term civil law at the bottom of page number two. Civil law is really how we're, as opposed to criminal law, a lot of the cases we're looking at today are civil in nature. So, for example, if a real estate agent doesn't pay another agent a referral fee that was promised, he's not going to go to jail for that, right? That's a civil lawsuit, for example. Cutting your neighbor's tree, that might not be criminal, but that's a civil lawsuit for damages. Now, where do most of our, at the top of page number three, where do most of our real estate laws come from? You know this. Where do most of our real estate laws come from? English common law, right? So at the very top of page number three, I would write the words English common law. And next to that, I would write the words real estate law from. Most of our real estate laws come from English common law, except there's an exception to this at the very top of page number three. And it is this concept of community property law. Community property is actually a holdover from Spain at the top of page number three. So you'll see at the top of page three where it says Spanish influence. Don't get these two questions wrong if you get them on the exam. Most of our real estate laws come from England, right? They come from English common law. The exception to that is this concept of community property. Community property, of course, says once you're married, everything that you own is basically cut in half, you and your spouse. That's not an English common law concept. That concept of community property is from, is from Spain. Now, if you look here on page number four, this is kind of a basic overview chapter where our laws come from. Of course, the First Amendment, the First Amendment is the right to free speech at the top of page number four. The First Amendment is the right to free speech. And one case that is kind of uh, illustrative of how free speech affects real estate agents is here at the top of page four. The Greater Baltimore Board of Realtors versus Baltimore County. Basically, in this case, what happened was a lot of real estate agents were going door to door. And if you took our real estate practice class, you remember that that's actually how uh, a lot of real estate agents get business is by door to door sales. Now, in this case, the county had passed a law saying real estate agents cannot go door to door, which sucks for us because we love going door to door because it's a way to get business for free, claiming that it was necessary to stop something called blockbusting on page number four, that this was necessary to stop blockbusting. Do you remember what blockbusting is? What's blockbusting? Debbie. Right, so blockbusting is basically where real estate agents knock on a bunch of doors and say, hey, I happen to know that minorities are moving into the area if you know what's good for you, you'll sell your property now before the neighborhood really goes to hell and values drop and crime goes up, sell your house now. So the county basically passed a law saying real estate agents cannot go door to door because some agents 
might engage in blockbusting or panic selling. That's horrible for us. Just because one of my colleagues is an idiot and might break the law, why should I be prevented from going door to door? The way that, the, the way that we beat this really with the Association of Realtors is we claim that that was an infringement on our First Amendment rights to free speech. And the Association of Realtors ended up winning. So free speech is a hallmark, of course, of the Constitution. It's the First Amendment. And it cannot be used or we cannot be blocked from door-to-door -door sales claiming that someone might break the law. Why is this important? Because hypothetically, if another city or another county tried to bar real estate agents from going door-to-door, -door, we might be able to beat that by pointing to this case under what? Stare, under stare, decesis, under stare, decesis. Now, a couple of things that I think are also important in this chapter. If you look here on page number eight, if you look here on page number eight at the very bottom, You'll see at the bottom of page number eight, an administrative agency makes laws and regulations to implement our federal laws. Now, California, of course, California has a state agency that basically oversees uh, real estate agents. And that state agency, of course, is known as the Department of Real Estate. And the funny thing about this is that the Department of Real Estate, of course, has been called this for like ever, for 70, 80 plus years since you know, the late 19, uh, since the early 1900s. In uh, July of 2013, the name is actually going to change. It's going to be called the Bureau of Real Estate as of, because of some budget cuts, uh, Governor Brown basically is eliminating the Department of Real Estate and folding it into the Department of Consumer Affairs. So it ain't going to be called the DRE anymore. It's going to be called the Bureau of Real Estate. Now, the Department of Real Estate, of course, is headed up by the Real Estate Commission. If you look at page number 10 at the middle, the Department of Real Estate is head up by the Real Estate Commissioner. And one thing that the Real Estate Commissioner does is that the Real Estate Commissioner investigates complaints against licensees. So if somebody complains about you as a real estate agent, the Real Estate Commissioner is the person that's in charge of kind of investigating that. The worst thing in the world that the real estate commissioner can do to you, the absolute worst thing is the commissioner could pull your license, right? The commissioner could take away your license. Now, your license is not going to be taken away without a hearing. So you're always going to be entitled to a hearing before any discipline is imposed on your license. At the very bottom of page number 10, the hearing is going to be conducted in accordance with the APA, or the Administrative Procedures Act at the very bottom of page number 10. So I'm just kind of going through the discipline process. The Department of Real Estate is the regulatory body that oversees real estate licensing in California. The DRE is head up by who? The Real Estate Commissioner. If someone complains about you, the commissioner is going to investigate that complaint in accordance with the Administrative Procedures Act. Now, the Administrative Procedures Act, this is actually a hearing. The person that is, is going to make the decision is not uh, the real estate commissioner. It's an administrative law judge. And this is going to be important. So an ALJ is basically going to oversee the hearing in accordance with the Administrative Procedures Act. Here's on page number, 10, uh, page number 11. Now, candidly, we're going to go over this case, but I don't believe that this same outcome would be the case today, right? I think it's changed or it's changing. An example of why, before, just as a little uh, overview to this. The RE-435 is the current form that you use to apply for your license, right? And this form asks a bunch of questions. Like, it's like have you ever been convicted of anything? Um, blah, 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 blah. Now, they changed this just a couple months ago. They changed this and now there's a question that asks, are you a registered sex offender? So that question is now, so I don't know that this same outcome would take place, but here's what happened it, the, on page number 11. Donaldson versus California Department of Real Estate. Thank you. Involved a real estate salesman, Donaldson, who was found guilty of unlawful intercourse with a minor, his wife's 16-year-old sister. So the guy's clearly an idiot, right? But the question now is, okay, the guy was convicted. The question now is, what about his real estate license? On one hand... This guy is a total terror. I mean, if I had a minor child 
And it was myself and my, let's say, 15-year-old daughter or 14-year-old daughter with this real estate agent. Frankly, I might not want to leave my, I wouldn't want to leave my daughter alone with this knucklehead. The other question is, okay, is this actually related to his qualifications and job duties of a real estate agent? So that's what we have to balance. Like, okay, he got convicted, but then should this affect his real estate license? So let's look what happened here. It says, the real estate commissioner filed a disciplinary accusation that he had committed crimes involving moral turpitude, right? So he's completely immoral. She alleged the crimes were substantially related under the California Code of Regulations to the qualifications, functions, or duties of a real estate licensee. The commissioner failed to adopt the administrative law judge proposal decision for a restricted license and just revoked it. So he went through a hearing in connection with or in accordance with the Administrative Procedures Act overseen by an administrative law judge. The administrative law judge said, okay, the guy's an idiot. However, I don't know that we should revoke his license. Let's just give him a restricted one, like a probationary type license. The commissioner said, screw you, administrative law judge. I don't really care what you say, frankly. I'm going to revoke his license anyway. So she revoked it. The Superior Court denied Donaldson's petition, uh, petition for administrative mandamus. Administrative mandamus is basically where you say a regulatory body, in this case the Department of Real Estate, revoked my license. I'm going to go to court and petition for administrative mandamus, where a court basically says the Department of Real Estate was wrong. The court orders the Department of Real Estate to give me back my license. What did the court say? A superior court denied Donaldson's petition for administrative mandamus. The Court of Appeal reversed, however, ruling the license revocation was not authorized because the conviction was not substantially related to his professional conduct. However, a 2008 amendment to the BNP eliminated the need to show moral turpitude. So basically what the book is saying, what I'm saying, is that in 2000, as of 08, I don't believe that you need to show moral turpitude. But back when this case happened in 2006, the commissioner basically had to give him his license back. So, again, I don't believe that this would, the same outcome would be the case today. I think you'd have outright revocation from the beginning, and you probably wouldn't be able to get it back. But back then, he got it back, right, based on the fact that uh, the commissioner did not adopt the administrative law judge's proposal. Um, on page number 16 and 17. These are going to take me some time, but it's worth it because it's important to understand how some of this stuff actually, uh, how some of this stuff works. So if you look at pages 16 and 17, uh, remedies, right? Judicial remedies and then equitable remedies. Judicial and equitable. Now, if you look here on page number 16, compensatory damages on page number 16. This is a judicial remedy. Compensatory are, look, I take a bat and I beat the crap out of your car, causing $2,500 worth of damage. You sue me. The judge orders me to give you $2,500 to fix your car. What's that called? Compensatory damages, right? I'm just compensating you for whatever damages I cause. Compensatory damages. Exemplary damages. Exemplary damages are also known as punitive damages. This is where the judge is like, look, give him the $2,500 because you screwed up his car. But on top of that, pay him another $5,000 to punish me, right? Punitive damages or exemplary damages. The next one is the one that we need to know for our real estate world. Liquidated damages. Liquidated damages. Now, liquidated damages are where we agree beforehand on penalty. Liquidated damages, and this is so important for real estate, liquidated damages are where the parties agree beforehand on what the remedy will be for default. Now, for example, if you look here uh, on page number uh, 16, of course, liquidated damages. Look, I really appreciate you being here today because you took a Saturday out, you're committed, right? You want to get your license and move on. Now, let's say I didn't show up. Like, you came here, and I just blew it up. I just overslept. I didn't show up. You're going to be pissed, right? If you had a babysitter that you paid $100 for the day for, and you 
got your kid lunch, and you had all these other costs associated with you coming here to class today. If you tried to sue me for me not showing up, you might get those compensatory damages, right? I'm going to have to make you whole again, let's say. But let's say we agreed yesterday that I was going to pay you $20 if I didn't show up. So we have this contract where you're going to take this class today, but if I don't show up, I'll owe you 20 bucks. Now, if I don't show up today and we agreed on that, what am I going to owe you? 20 bucks, right? If you start yapping about, you know, how you had a babysitter and you had all this other, you know, food costs and you had, you know, your gas here and your time and you're a cardiologist, so your time is $900 an hour and you start getting me for all sorts of stuff, I'm, and we agreed on this, how much money am I going to owe you? 20 bucks, no matter what your other costs are. This is liquidated damages. So if you look here at the bottom of page number 16, do me a huge favor. This will make sense in a second. Right next to liquidated damages, I would write the word or the words buyer breach. If the buyer breaches the contract, the penalty is generally liquidated damages. This is going to make more sense in a second. But if the buyer breaches, the penalty is liquidated damages. This is money where we agree on some dollar amount that the buyer is going to pay the seller. Now, if you look here on page number 17 at the top, you have another term at the top of page 17 called specific performance. Do me a favor, right next to specific performance, I would write the words seller breach. So this is an equitable remedy, specific performance, and then I would write the words seller breach. So if the seller breaches, meaning I'm going to sell you my house, we have a contract, but after we sign the contract, I say, ah, screw it, I'm not going to sell it to you anymore. I don't want to sell it anymore. Now, do you want money from me or do you want my house? You want my house, right? Because it's so unique. I'll give you another example. Let's say that you're, you're, think back to your wedding day. At least your first marriage, right? The special one. So think back to your wedding day. And let's say that I was the photographer at your wedding. And I'm snapping away. I got five other photographers. We're taking all these pictures. And then I call you the next day. And I'm like, hey, bad news. Uh, those were new cameras. And I didn't know how to operate them. I don't have any pictures. There's no easy way to say it. I just don't have any pictures of your wedding. Now, you're pissed. If you could pick, do you want money from me or do you want the pictures if you could pick? You want the pictures, right? You can't just do over the wedding. So when the subject matter of the contract is so unique that money is not an adequate remedy, the appropriate, what we want is specific performance. In, in the case that the buyer breaches, I'm going to buy your house, but I decide, ah, screw it, I don't want it anymore. All I had was money. My money isn't so unique, right? My money is just as green as the next guy's. So if the buyer backs out, if the buyer breaches, what do we want? Money through something called liquidated damages. If the seller breaches, what do we want? Specific performance. Now, let me quickly show you something here real quick. I want to show you where this is in the contract itself. If you look here on page number 208, don't get excited. We didn't just skip all that. But if you look at page number 208, paragraph 25 on 208, this is, an exam this is the liquidated damages clause in the residential purchase agreement. This is the liquidated damages clause in the purchase contract. Now, I'm going to save you some reading on page number 208. I'll just quickly go over what this says. If the buyer and the seller initial this paragraph, this is paragraph number 25 on page 208. If the buyer and seller initial this paragraph, it means liquidated damages. They are agreeing beforehand on the penalty in the event of what? Buyer breach. So if the buyer breaches the contract, here is what's going to happen. Buyer loses deposit. So anytime you buy a piece of real estate, anytime you buy a piece of real estate, you basically paperclip a bribe to the contract. Usually it's like 1% to 3% of the purchase price. So if I'm going to buy your $400,000 property, I might have like a $6,000 deposit, let's say. Now, of course, the bigger the deposit, the more serious you look as a buyer. The more money you throw down, the more serious you look. If liquidated damages is agreed to and the buyer breaches... The penalty is that the buyer is just going to lose all their deposit, right? However, if it is a one-to-four unit, 
residential property and the buyer intends to occupy one of the units. Like, I'm going to live there. It's my house. I will either lose the total deposit I put down or 3% of the purchase price, whichever is less. So, just to review, liquidated damages, paragraph 25 on page 208, it's optional. We don't have to initial it. But if you do initial it, and you pull out of the deal after you're allowed, you have a little bit of a due diligence period. It's typically 17 days where you could like get your inspections and all that. But if you remove your contingencies and you just say, ah, screw it, I don't want it anymore. And you have initialed liquidated damages, you're going to lose your deposit. Now, what if the seller starts yapping about, well, I got a moving truck and I lost out on another deal and, you know, X, Y, and Z and you owe me more. You're not going to owe them more because you've initialed what? Liquidated Damages. Now, if you haven't initial this, you might be stuck for all that, right? So in the event that the buyer breaches, the penalty is that the buyer's going to lose their deposit unless it's a residential one to four unit property owner occupied. Then you'll either lose the deposit or what? 3% of the purchase price, whichever is less. So I'll give you two examples of this. You're buying a $500,000 house in a very competitive real estate market like the one we're in right now, right? We're in a super competitive market. A lot of buyers, no inventory. It sucks. Now, let's say in order to be competitive, this is a house you're going to buy, but in order to be competitive, you put down like a $30,000 deposit, right? You put down $30,000. You just, you're super duper serious. Now, if you're going to occupy one of, if you're going to occupy the property and you breach, how much of this $30,000 are you going to lose? How much of this are you going to lose? You're going to lose. If it's owner-occupied, are you going to lose all of it? Is it 3% of the 30 or 3% of the 500? 3% of the 500. So if you wrote this offer, stay with me. If you wrote this offer, you're going to lose 3% of the purchase price. So that's $15,000. Where's that going to go? The seller gets to keep it. You kind of screwed the seller over because you backed out when you shouldn't have or after you could. 15000 is going to go to the seller. The other $15,000 is going to go where? It's going to go back to the buyer, right? Why? Because in my story, the property was going to be owner-occupied. Now, if it was not owner-occupied or an investment property, how much of this 30 would I lose? All of it, right? Why? Because an investor is presumed to be more sophisticated than just, you know, John and Sally Smith buying their first home. So just a global overview. What is liquidated damages? It's where the parties agree before there's a breach on what a remedy will be if there were a breach. In the event that the buyer breaches and you've agreed on liquidated damages, what are you going to lose? The whole deposit. The deposit is gone. Unless it's an owner-occupied residential one to four unit property and we've agreed on liquidated damages, what am I going to lose? Either the deposit or 3% of the purchase price, whichever is less. Say that again. Distinction in what way? Because John and Sally Smith buying their first home with an idiot real estate agent might not know, hey, look, like not fully understand this. So when you buy your, a residential property, we limit the downside, right, to the buyer because they really might not have a full understanding. But if it's not owner occupied, who are you now? You're an investor, right? You're just presumed to like know what's up. You're presumed to be more sophisticated than somebody just buying their first home. So liquidated damages sets a ceiling on what the buyer will lose if the buyer breaches the contract. If the seller breaches, what does the buyer want? The the property. I want the house, right? Just like that. I can't go buy the house next door. The house next door, even if it is for sale, it's not that house. Every house has a different view and a different energy and a different, you know, interior. So because real estate is highly unique, the penalty for a seller breaching is specific performance. If a buyer breaches, the buyer doesn't have anything so unique. My money is just as green as the next guy's. If the buyer breaches, lose the deposit. If the seller breaches, then what? Specific performance performance, an equitable remedy. Now, if you look back here on pages 16 and 17, back on pages 16 and 17, bottom of page 16, nominal damages. Nominal damages are like, look, okay, you're at fault. 
pay me like a dollar. Just something on page number 16 at the bottom, just something saying, hey, look, just a token uh, penalty just to show, you know, it's more of a, uh, like an, it's, it's more of just an example. It's not really compensating you for anything. It's just pay him a dollar. Okay, you're at fault. Give the guy a buck. Now, if you look here on page number 17, another equitable remedy that I think is important to know for the exam is this concept of rescission, is this concept of rescission on page number 17. Now, some real estate deals, particularly in finance, have a rescission period. Let me give you an example of a contract that doesn't have rescission. Let's say that I go to the local BMW dealership to buy a, a car, and I got the, the smallest one in mind. Let's say it's, I don't know what they cost, 35, 40,000 bucks. I walk in there ready to buy the smallest BMW, and that salesperson is such a monster, I leave in a $150,000 beast. I come home and I go to sleep and I wake up the next morning and I'm like, man, I screwed up. This is really bad. I can't afford this car. I drive that car back to the dealership and I want my money back. There is no law that says that they have to give me my money back. There's no rescission. Some contracts have, by statute, a three-day rescission period. The one that I would write at the middle of page 17 for the exam, super important, I would write refinance primary residence. When you refinance your primary residence, you have a built-in three-day right of rescission. So, for example, if I refinance my house, there are some people in real estate finance that are a bit sketchy, that are maybe a little untrustworthy. So if I'm getting a new loan on the home that I live in, my castle, I have three business days, even after I've signed everything, to make sure that I'm okay, to make sure that this is really, really what I want. I do not have that same right when I buy a house. If I buy a house and I spend the first night there and I have all these weird nightmares and I'm like, man, this is crazy, I don't like it anymore, I can't go back to that seller and get my money back by statute, right? The seller does not have to give me my money back. I'm, I better buy some sage, right? Sprinkle some holy water, call a priest, whatever it is, because there's no right of rescission when you purchase. There is a right of rescission when you what? Refinance. Now, if I refinance this building, do I have a three-day right of rescission on this building? Do I have a three-day right of rescission on this building? I don't. There is no three-day right of rescission on this building. Why? It's not my primary residence. So what is rescission? It's where both parties agree to cancel a contract in a process called rescission. Now, is there a fee to rescind? There's no fee. I don't have to pay for that. Now, if I'm pulling $100,000 of my equity out of my house, do you think Wells Fargo is going to give me my equity while I'm still in this rescission period? Hell no, right? Because if they give me the money and I decide I want to cancel, what are the odds I'm going to give them that money back? Zero, right? So what is rescission? It's where both parties agree to cancel a contract at no charge. Can you name a real estate finance contract that has a three-day right of rescission? Refinancing your primary residence. Pulling your equity out of your home will trigger a three-day rescission right. Uh, pay, on pages 18 and 19, two things on 18 and 19. One of them is at the top of page number 18. One of them is at the top of page number 18. It's called a quiet title action. Now, last year, uh, early 2000, February of 2012, I closed this real estate deal where uh, this husband had killed his wife. They were both joint tenants, and the husband killed the wife. Now, the wife had kids from a prior marriage. And the current husband, who is not the biological father of these other children, uh, murdered the wife. Not on the property, but murdered the wife. Now, the question is, now, who owns it? Right? Because the husband and wife are joint tenants, in this case. Husband kills the wife. In joint tenancy, when one party dies, what happens? The other one gets it. Now, this is a murderer allegedly trying to profit from his crime. Now, we don't know who owns the property at this point. Now, of course, the kids, who's uh, the murderer, of course, is not the biological father of uh, the children. So the question now becomes, well, who owns it? The children filed something called a list pendants on the property. And we'll talk about this later on in the book. 
But lis pendens is a Latin term that means pending litigation. This necessitates a quiet title action. Title is ownership. Quiet title means I want to bring an action to determine who actually owns the property, right? It's a quiet title. The title is yelling because we don't know who the true owner is. We need to bring an action to quiet it down. So what is a quiet title action? It's an action to determine what? Ownership, the rights of the parties, who the true owner of the property is. Now, if you look at 18 and 19, two last things. Mediation versus arbitration. Mediation versus arbitration. One key difference between mediation and arbitration, arbitration is binding upon the parties on page numbers uh, 18 and 19. Arbitration is binding upon the parties. Mediation is not binding. So what is a mediation? Mediation is where the parties that are fighting get in a room and try to hash it out. But there's no decision powers in that room. We try to squash it amongst ourselves. Arbitration is where you and I go in front of a third party, arbitrator, and that person basically renders a decision. That decision is binding as though a judge had given it. So you go mediation, and then if you can't figure it out in mediation, you either go mediation to arbitration, done, or mediation, jury trial, done. You don't go mediation, arbitration, jury trial. You don't go mediation, jury trial, arbitration. So the key difference between mediation and arbitration is that arbitration is what? Binding. Arbitration is binding upon the parties. And by the way, if you look here uh, in the purchase contract, if you look here in the purchase contract on page number 200 and, uh, 208, paragraph 26, dispute resolution, same thing, just like liquidated damages on page number 208, just like liquidated damages, this is also optional. You don't have to initial liquidated damages on page number 25. You don't have to initial arbitration, uh, uh, pardon me, on paragraph 26. It is optional. So if you don't agree on arbitration, where could you take that dispute? To a jury trial, right? Now, either way, whether it relates to liquidated damages or arbitration, you should never have this only initialed by one party. If the buyer wants arbitration and the seller doesn't, you would counter that until you either both agree or you both don't want it. If, you, if what the seller wants liquidated damages but the buyer doesn't, then what? We counter it out, right? Either both parties agree or nobody agrees. So if you agree on paragraph number 26 on page 208, if you agree to arbitrate and there's a dispute between the buyer and seller, where do you go? Arbitration. Right? If you don't, you could go to arbitration or you could go to a full-blown jury trial. What's the difference between mediation and arbitration? Arbitration is binding upon the parties where mediation is not. Any questions about Chapter 1 at all? Which one? Oh, we closed the transaction. Um, the, the children agreed to split it in some ratio. So I don't know how many kids there were. No, no, the father's in jail. I was representing the buyer on that, so my client was not the murderer. Um, but, um, yeah, my client was the buyer, um, and the kids, we were waiting while the kids figured it out. But they squashed it. Some, something happened where there was a release. They, signed a quick, they all signed quick claim deeds, and then the transaction was able to close. The complicated thing about that deal, though, was dad's in jail, mom's dead. What's the biggest problem with that? Think about it. Who's making the mortgage payment? Right? No one. So we're facing a foreclosure sale as the kids are trying to, you know, resolve their dispute. So we closed little like a week before the property was at trustee sale. So. Well, my buyer got the house, but the kids split up the equity or, uh, from the property. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't, go, it didn't revert back to the husband. No, 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 no. Because of the murder. Because of the murder. Exactly. Exactly. And what's he going to buy in jail, right? Oh, yeah. You know, cigarettes. <laughs> right. So. 
Of course, the big, other, another big challenge with that was I didn't get paid on that. The deal closed in February. I think I might have got paid in November because my commission was subject to the probate court approval and all that. So it was, uh, you see, I was a long, long, long time. Ago. So any contracts to sale would be ratified by the California Adult Authority because while you're in prison, you can't enter into contracts. So every contract to sell it would be ratified by the CAA. Yeah, so you're, you own it. Yeah. Now, if you kill someone, of course, the problem is, right, exactly, you're, pl you're planning. I see the flow chart. Um, <laughs> no, but um, the problem is, of course, like what happened with O.J. Simpson is that, you know, he got, he was found, he was acquitted criminally, but he was found guilty uh, in civil court. So that's why he's broke, right? Because even though he's in jail now, but that's why he's broke because, you know, future earnings, what would those people have earned over time? So all that stuff is eventually going to be you know, you're going to have to pay out to the victim anyway because you're probably going to, even if you get off on the criminal, in case of O.J., he was found, uh, he was found guilty in civil court. For, that's why he wrote that book, um, like, if I did it, but I really didn't, but it, had I done it, this is what would have happened, you know, whatever. Um, all, the, all the proceeds from that book were ordered to go to, you know, the families of the victims. So. Yeah, but that's, it's exactly, to pay out the civil claim. Don't, kill anyone. <laughs>